All right, let's talk about some acoustic stuff and specifically stuff that might be relevant to you if you're trying to build a home studio. Okay, so there are a couple of things that come to mind here when we're talking about acoustics and building a home studio or a commercial studio too, to be honest. But it's, it's you know, the idea of one, when, when do you treat acoustically? When do you treat your space? When do you try to improve it, right? And my answer to that would be when your mixes are not translating Uh, When you move out of the studio, that's when you should consider what to do next in your space to improve it. Um, So once I got my mixes to where they were translating pretty well, um, reliably enough, right, that I could I could work and and bounce something and be like, yeah, I feel confident that that'll sound good elsewhere. I um, I stopped spending as much time thinking about what to do next in this space. So if you're wondering whether you need to do something, think about how things sound when you then move them out of your space. Does it sound good? Something to consider. Now, the other thing to think about before we get started, just because it's kind of relevant to the basic acoustic stuff that we're going to be talking about today, is the idea that the speed of sound is is constant. It's relatively constant. It's considered a constant. So it's 344 meters per second. There are some instances when it changes slightly. So if you're at a really high altitude, I believe it changes slightly. If you're in a really foggy environment, it can change slightly because essentially the sound is going through water in addition to air. It's going through more water than than usual within the air, right? Because the, the speed of sound will change when it's in different materials. But it's good to know because I have seen people confuse the idea of um, different frequencies, right? So you have low frequencies and high frequencies. Low frequencies have longer wavelengths, but that doesn't actually mean that the part of, like the, the particles are moving through the air, the wave is moving through the air at a different speed. The speed of sound is still constant. We just have different wavelengths for different frequencies. So for example, different frequencies will not move through the air at different speeds. Something to keep in mind. And you know, the other reason why that is relevant is because since the speed of sound is constant or it's considered a constant, it's constant enough, um, we can think about things in terms of either distance or time. So you can think about the way that the sound travels through space in terms of the time that it takes for, for example, a, w- a waveform you know, to go from point A to point B, or we can think about it in terms of distance. So for example, low frequencies have longer wavelengths, so they take up a bigger distance within the air, right? They take up a different distance within the actual physical space that they're in. So to go from the starting point of a wave and complete one cycle, it's going to be a different distance than it would be, for example, with a shorter frequency. It's going to start the cycle and complete it within a shorter distance. So you can think about it in terms of distance or time. And I hope that makes sense. The, the way that I think about it with the time end of that is, for example, you think about something that's creating the sound. So it's my vocal cords vibrating, or it's a gu- guitar string vibrating, or it's something vibrating, right? It has to be vibrating uh, regularly for us to perceive it as sound even, right? So you think about something vibrating, you think about how many times it vibrates per second, right? That's our frequency. That's our hertz value. And so you can then think about that in terms of time. To complete one cycle, it takes a certain amount of time. So they take up distance, physical space, and then they take up time, depending on the frequency. Okay, so first let's talk about different types of treatment, right? So we have absorption, we have diffusion, and then we have bass traps. Those are kind of the three main categories of acoustic treatment, acoustic Um, I don't know, acoustic categories that we talk about. So the first thing is absorption. This is the one that people tend to be the most familiar with. So if you see, for example, foam that people put up on their walls, that is a form of absorption. We can also talk about different things absorbing sound. I can speak. Um, So things like my sofa absorbs a lot of sound, right? Things that are um, big and pillowy like blankets, tapestries, um, different materials will absorb sound differently. And it often has to do with the density of the material. And we can talk about different materials and how they affect things acoustically in another video if you want. Just let me know if you want to see that in the comments below. I'm going to move my mic back just in case it's causing trouble here. So we talk about absorption. We talk about things like foam that are absorbing. I have a bunch of things in this space that absorb sound, right? Including things that fall into other categories like bass traps, right? Bass traps absorb sound, but they um, are targeting bass frequencies, which tend to go through objects. So we have absorption, and a lot of times we have things, for example, that 
will only target high frequency ranges. So a lot of times the really cheap studio foam is only actually targeting uh, upper frequencies, right? Which can really help improve a space. If you have a lot of natural reverb that doesn't sound good, right? It can help you deaden that. It can be very, very helpful. But with that said, a lot of times when we're working on building a studio, we want to have something that absorbs the full frequency spectrum. We want to have stuff that can help us target all the different frequencies that uh, are at least audible, right, to us. So, so that's why you have things like the more expensive studio foam versus the cheaper studio foam, right? The more expensive studio foam or the traps that are like thicker, you know, you can often buy panels that are absorption panels. A lot of times those will target a different range of frequencies than something like uh, the freestanding studio foam, you know, like the Oralex or what have you. And so that's kind of the logic behind why it makes sense that we have, you know, studio foam that's really cheap sometimes versus the more expensive stuff. A lot of times the cheap stuff doesn't absorb as much and it doesn't absorb as big a range of frequencies, right? And then we also have different types of absorption tools or absorption products that we can buy, right? So we have things like panels that will target a more full range of frequencies. And then we have things like the the square um foam pieces where they're like, you know, sometimes they're kind of corrugated looking. Uh, those are for a different purpose than something like my panels here, which are actually standing base traps as well. So they're an absorptive panel, right? But they also target a full range of frequencies. So when you're looking at absorption, you can go for what makes sense for your budget and for what you need, right? And you know, we talk about a room's natural reverb. You might also hear the term flutter echo going around. So if you like clap in your room and you hear the sound bouncing around, it's almost like a delay type of effect. Um, that is flutter echo. Those higher upper frequencies kind of bouncing around the room. That is what we mean when we talk about flutter echo. So absorption can really help with flutter echo. It can help uh, combat natural reverb that you don't want, whether that's in something like a control room type of space or that's in something like a sound booth type of space, right? Uh, it can help you target that. So some things you can use for absorption are things like, you know, the foam. So you can get a range of different products that count as studio foam, right? So there's more affordable ones. There are fancier ones out there. So you can get foam, you can use stuff like drapes, carpeting, furniture, things that are big and fluffy tend to, to do well in this space, right? So my sofa, since it's fabric and it has a lot of cushioning into it, it, uh, it is absorbing a good amount of sound, right? So if you want to help improve your space, one of the things you can do that's not just getting like uh, custom purpose studio foam is just get like a fluffy carpet add drapes, you know, like do things to help add um, <laughs> fluffiness, <laughs> to add fluffiness, to add something to absorb the sound for you. So you can do stuff like that. Um, and then you could also go all the way up to like something like what I've done, which is where you get a bunch of um, custom purpose acoustic foam and put it up. Okay, so then we have diffusion. And essentially what diffusion is doing, the way that I think about it, is that it's changing the length of the room as we move across the room. And so when we think about most rooms, they have parallel walls, right? And when you have parallel walls, the length of the room is the same distance, right? We're talking about distance again, um, across the entire room. And so what happens with that is certain frequencies, if they start at one end of the room and they travel across the room and then they bounce off the wall and they come back, they may, if they are, um, what is it, a multiple or divisible within the room distance, what happens is that as they come back, they might, for example, the more rarefied sections of air within the waveform might hit the more compressed sections of air in the waveform that's coming back, and then they would cancel themselves out. So certain frequencies might get canceled out in a room with parallel walls, and then certain frequencies might augment themselves, which would be the opposite thing, right? So um, more compressed areas hitting the more compressed areas as they travel, and that would... Um, cause them to augment themselves to become more intense, right? So we add diffusion to help change that distance so that it's not the same frequencies causing trouble throughout the room, right? And then hopefully as they move, since sound kind of it just moves out in all directions, um, having that difference actually really does significantly improve the acoustics within the space. And the other thing to keep in mind is it also does help with flutter echo, right? So things can't bounce around as much without being inhibited by the diffuser. 
So a lot of times we see diffusers in control rooms, for example. So a lot of times you'll see them like behind where the uh, engineer sits, right? And a lot of times it's like a wooden panel and it'll have different blocks that are different distances that are sticking out from the wall, for example. I'll put some pictures up on the screen so you can see them. But basically another thing to consider is that diffusers help us treat our acoustic space without getting rid of as much of the energy, the actual acoustic energy in the space when you're putting sound out in there, right? So it helps us uh, not deaden the energy. It helps make the room not sound too small, right? Because as we add absorption, we deaden that natural reverb. The room can start to sound very small, right? So a lot of times we'll use diffusers in um, big like Studio A rooms where we want to have a sense of space or we'll use them in the control room where it's good to have a little bit of a sense of space without completely deadening everything. Um, you won't see them as much in things like small vocal booths where the whole idea is to just deaden it so you can get a clean sound and then you add your reverb or whatever you may or may not want later, right? So if you're doing something like, for example, recording audiobooks or spoken word or voiceovers or anything like that, you might not care so much about having a diffuser in your recording space, right? You might just want to deaden a vocal booth type of thing and not have a diffuser. But if you want to, if you're working on music, for example, and you want to have a really nice space that has nice acoustics for recording in, you may want to have the option of having that space have some nice natural reverb in it. And so one way you can help improve that natural reverb, right? We use the word natural, but you know, it's because it's in an actual physical space, right? It's not be because it was not manipulated by us, right? So if you're manipulating a space like that to improve the natural reverb in it, then you might want to include a diffuser in there to help keep the energy without deadening it too much. So some things you can use for diffusers. There's a range, again, of things you can use. You can buy actual diffusers. Um, so you can go to, you know, any music supply place, right, any store, and you can actually buy a diffuser that's pre-made. Sometimes they're like um, 3D molded plastic type of, I don't know if they're always plastic, but like 3D molded things. Sometimes they're made of wood. You know, there's like a range of them out there. Um, you can also make one, right? So people often make their own diffusers. If you do, I would recommend finding one of the calculators online that helps you calculate like the ideal distances to use for your diffuser based on your room size, because there is a way to calculate that. And then you you know that you're improving it to the best of your ability, right? Instead of just kind of shooting in the dark and picking random lengths for the different diffusers. But a lot of times the way that people make diffusers is they'll take a two by two and they'll cut it into those different lengths. So you might have like four different lengths that you want on your diffuser and you'll cut a bunch of pieces to those four lengths and then you stick them onto something like a piece of plywood and you know maybe frame it and then stick it on the wall. And that's basically it. Um, you can paint it to make it look pretty if you want. You can sand it down. Um, some people just put it rough like that on the wall and it works, you know. Another thing you can do for diffusion that's kind of the more affordable option is to put a bookshelf in your space. So oftentimes people put it behind where the engineer is sitting. So it would be behind me here. And basically the idea is that if you have a bookshelf and you put a bunch of books on it, it can't be an empty bookshelf, right? It has to be a bookshelf with a bunch of books on it. The books are, um, you know, pretty dense. They're made of wood right? They're pretty dense. And so if you have a bunch of different books on the shelf, especially if they are not all uniform, right? This is one of those instances where it's kind of good to have a bookshelf that's not curated so that it looks perfect, right? You basically don't want it to be uniform, right? You don't want like a set of encyclopedias where they're all the same exact size and it's just that across the whole bookshelf because then there's no variance between the distance, you know? So if you think about uh, the distance from one wall to the wall with the bookshelf, and you think about how far the books stick out in various spots in the bookshelf, you want there to be some variance there. I hope that makes sense. Let me know if that doesn't make sense. But again, the idea is you can use something like a bookshelf that you are, may already have, right? You can purchase a diffuser or you can build your own. Okay, so the third category is the category of bass traps. And this is something that beginners tend to ignore a lot, but it can really improve your studio acoustics. So it's something that's good to think about. Um, so it's good to know that bass frequencies tend to go through objects, right? So things that high frequencies will get absorbed by will often allow base frequencies to pass through. And that's because things have to be a higher density usually to absorb a bass frequency. So an example of this that you've probably noticed is if someone drives by and they're blasting music in their car but their windows are up, you're going to hear more bass frequencies coming through that car. And that's because the car itself is absorbing a lot of the high frequencies and the bass frequencies are passing through the car to your ears. So 
Base frequencies tend to go through things. They also often get bounced around by the higher density things in your space. So a lot of times this has to do with like the frame of your building or, you know, if you have high density things within your actual space. Um, but one thing that tends to happen is that base frequencies will build up in the corners of your room. So if you blast some music in your room, you walk around the space and listen to the base frequencies, you'll notice that the base frequencies are probably louder in the corners of your space. So that's why a lot of the time what we do to help control bass frequencies is we will put bass traps in the corners because those frequencies tend to go down into the corners and they'll build up in there. And if you have something to absorb the frequencies that kind of, um, you know, helps cancel them, right, helps stop them, then you won't have as much of an issue controlling your bass frequencies in your room. So if you're noticing that your low end is not translating in your mix, you might need a sub for one. But the other thing to keep in mind is that you could need bass traps, right? And so there are foam bass traps that are really affordable that you can get and just put in the corner of your space. And remember, each room, it's not just four corners on the floor, it's also on the ceiling if it's if it's a rectangular room. And one thing that I'll recommend to people is if they're looking to save money, right, is to get the absorptive material first and then put it up and then go around in their space and listen to how the bass frequencies sound to see if it's an issue that you might want to treat. But yeah, your options here are kind of similar to our other categories, right? So there are more affordable bass traps that often look just like studio foam, but often they are in the shape of the corner of your room. So it'll be like a 3D, it's like a pyramid kind of, I think it's like a pyramid. Um, I'll put a photo up on the screen for you. But you can get affordable bass trap foam. You can also get more high-end options. I have like standing bass traps behind me that you can see. I also have bass traps in the corners of my room that are gig acoustics. Um, and I've been very happy with those. And you can also build your own bass traps. So if you want to get into that, if you want a video on that, let me know um, in the comments below. But just know that you can go out and you can Google how to make this yourself. You just have to use slightly different materials if you're targeting base frequencies than other frequencies because, again, you need something that can actually physically absorb those frequencies. So I think I've talked enough for now. I'm going to cut things off for now. And next week, I'm going to continue with some more practical tips uh, that build on these concepts. So I guess, as always, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Check out my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash noise, and we have additional content on there. We have early release videos. We have a Discord server we're hanging out on. We're running a book club on there. There's a whole range of, of things that are on the Patreon if you want to check it out. And other than that, I come out with new videos every Wednesday, and thank you so much for hanging out. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, um... What's new? It's Sunday. I'm tired. It's Sunday and I'm tired. I really don't know what to say. Um, oh, a lizard made it into my house the other day and my bunny, uh, I walked into the house and found my bunny holding off a lizard that was at the bedroom door. And so she was very fiercely fighting off this lizard. And by fighting, I mean like they were in a standoff, right? So the lizard had been trying to come into the bedroom and had just stopped because she was right there like, uh-uh, no, you're not coming in here. So that was fun. I got to catch the lizard and then I got to stare at the lizard for a while. It was kind of cool. It has like these little tiny ear holes. And then it was opening its mouth at me and like tracking me. So I I was I had it in a Tupperware and I was like rotating it and it was like watching me like that. You know, like it was rotating its head as I moved the thing so it could watch me. And it was making this like Mah! face at me, which was kind of fun. But then I realized I didn't want to scare it too much. So I, I let it go after a few minutes. But that was fun. It had little tiny fingers. It was so tiny. Okay, I think that's it. I hope you're all doing well.